This episode is in response to a question posed on January 19th by Jay Diaz, who wants to know what really happened in the death of Cheyenne Cadena on December 17, 1972. The death of Mexican Mafia member Cheyenne Cadena has been spun so many ways through the decades. It's easy to understand how misinformation, whether intentional or not, takes on its own life and almost becomes factual. For example, there are folks who attempt to portray Joe Morgan as the instigator of Shai's death. Stories abound with some having Joe ordering the hits of two rival prison gang members in order to sabotage a peace treaty being negotiated by Cheyenne and the NF. This is inaccurate and nonsensical speculation. Here's the Cheyenne story. From the 1968 Shoe War, there is already a Perplex News episode about this. Through October 1970, except for some skirmishes in B-section, Mexican Mafia and Nuestra Familia members were segregated from each other in the prison system. In October 1970, with tensions mounting between L.A. convicts against the NF and its sympathizers, San Quentin gang investigator Sergeant Bill Hankins arranged for MM member Big Mike Mohern to meet with NF leader Gonzalo Chalo Hernandez and Maravilla representative Louis Arajo, a get-together that took place on the upper yard. An agreement to not pursue hostilities was reached following this summit. A few months later, Cheyenne Cadena made a brief stop on his way from Folsom to Chino Prison. Cheyenne was housed in the B-Section Segregation Unit on this layover and was months away from being released on parole. Sergeant Hankins allowed Chalo Hernandez, who was also Cheyenne's cousin and Bakersfield homeboy, an opportunity to meet with Shy and lock them inside Cheyenne's B-Section cell. Now that took some intestinal fortitude on Hankins' part, if you ask me. The official final word that came from that meeting was no hostilities would take place between the two prison gangs. Despite what misinformed people might say, up to this point, not one NF or MM member had actually died from fighting each other in this short period of hostility. One LA gang member, Cricket from Diamond, killed in 1968 during the Shoe War Uprising, and several NF and MN non-fatal stabbing victims made up the brief casualty list at the end of 1970 and entering 1971. Despite the hotheads on both sides, only someone of Cheyenne and Charlo's stature could talk about coexisting with no hostilities and could initiate or author such an agreement. The entire year of 1971 would produce not one NF or M attack against each other at any California institution. Believe it or not, the two gangs actively interacted, shared prison drugs, Chalo and Big Mike actually got high together often, and walked the yards without incident, all due to the detente or no hostility agreement carved out by Cheyenne and Chalo. Sergeant Hankins' role in maintaining order on the San Quentin Big Yard should be historically noted. At the time, we hated Hankins' guts because he would not allow Emmett to be released from the lockup units and favored the NF because there was harmony and little or no violence with the NF on the yard. His unique relationship with three of the Nuestra Familia's first wave members will be covered in detail in a future Perplex News episode. Those of you interested in historical facts, no matter where they take us, will marvel at this bit of history. For the detailed story behind the story, stay tuned for that future episode entitled M and NF in San Quentin after the shoe war. 
Sergeant Hankins maintained law and order, with both groups walking his yard incident-free for over a year. Hankins' way of looking at career criminals meant throwing away the key on those who did not wish to program. He would do that to many of us, including myself, in a future time frame. In December of 1971, a new NF recruit named Daniel Woodsy Reyes tried to stir the pot and was responsible for a property ownership disagreement between the prison gangs. Woodsy's fellow NF members elected to surrender an inmate money earner to the M.A., but Woodsy held out and a temporary compromise was reached. A few months later, when the issue resurfaced and became an irreconcilable problem, the following incidents became the spark that would set off the powder keg. Stemming directly from this dispute, Nuestra Familia members Death Row Joe Gonzalez from Chiques and Woodsy Reyes from Bakersfield were stabbed by Mexican Mafia members Chavo Perez from Bakersfield, Black Segura from Eastside Clover, and Cheetah Padilla from Chino. Death Row Joe and Woodsy survived their wounds. This incident took place on April 4, 1972, on the San Quentin ramp leading from the kitchen to the lower yard. Officer W. Cartner was the wall post three gunman who fired the warning shots and directed other prison guards to where the weapons had been thrown. The participating inmates were apprehended at the crime scene and locked up. Six days later, on April 10th, NF member and an old friend of mine, Frank Joker Mendoza from Redondo, retaliated by stabbing MS Louis Valenzuela from Primera Flats, also non-fatally. The War of 1972 was officially triggered. The fella circulated the word to all prisons that it was open season on farmeros, the derisive term used to describe NF members. I would certainly believe the NF did likewise. For eight and a half months, the MNF War of 72 claimed 11 lives connected with this rivalry. The chart you are viewing of prison gang members only gives you the date of each murder, name of each victim with prison gang affiliation, the suspect name and prison gang affiliation, and the prison where each murder took place. Every victim and suspect was identified as validated prison gang members. In a future episode, I will cover each fatal stabbing from the War of 1972 so that viewers can understand these historical events in their proper perspective. The chart you are viewing speaks for itself as we enter December of 1972. So there were only a few Mexican Mafia members who embraced the anti-establishment, radical ideology put forward by left-wing extremists. Cheyenne was one, but the most radical by far was Luis Vala Talamantes from Venice who was formally charged and prosecuted with members of the Black Gorilla family for the August 21, 1971 San Quentin incident where three correctional officers and two inmates were executed. BGF member George Jackson also died in this incident. If any of you carefully read the comments on Perplex News, there is a conspiracy theorist who talks about many subjects including the BGF and Mexican Mafia guys who participated in the San Quentin, August 21, 1971 incident. He states the two white inmates who were killed were members of the Aryan Brotherhood. He obviously does not understand prison dynamics. First of all, the two white inmates were snitches, and that is why they died. Had they been AB members, killed in an uprising perpetrated by BGF and MA co-conspirators, there were AB members on every prison yard in 1971 to avenge this. Does anyone really believe the AB would simply forgive and forget? No BGF or MA would be attacked by the AB? MA and AB members would join hands in many events in which rival gang members were killed including BGF members. 
That alone should tell you something. Once again, the facts are the facts. I can personally confirm that 99% of Mexican Mafia guys did not agree with this socialist ideology, but did allow Vala to pursue his hobby so long as it did not interfere with Emma business. Cheyenne's vision of unification with the NF was inspired by outside left-wing radicals who desired to pit Mexican inmates, the BGF, and other radicals against what they enjoyed calling the white oppressor. In the middle of an MNF war, a war that was into its eighth month, with eight total fatalities, one per month, you would think everyone connected to each prison gang would have received the memo, right? At this point, we had never lost an Emek Carnal to any rival prison gang. Cheyenne, who had already paroled from Chino and returned on a parole violation in 1972 for possessing a trunkload of guns, was transferred from Folsom to the Palm Hall unit in Chino, heavily populated at that time by several Nuestra Familia members and some of their associates. Cheyenne agreed to be housed at Palm Hall to meet with NF leaders about establishing another ceasefire. Without a doubt, Cheyenne possessed the respect, reputation, and ability to broker the No Hostilities Agreement in 1971. But 1972 was a different year and bodies were falling throughout the prison system. As an overwhelming majority, Peace talks were the furthest thing from our collective minds when Cheyenne convinced gang investigators to transfer him to Chino Palm Hall to moderate and talk peace. So Cheyenne walked the Palm Hall yard with NF members while the war was on everywhere else. From the Chino Processing Center, other MM members communicated with Shai. Ramon Calote Amador from Wilmas and Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez from Barro Nuevo were on the other side of the fence in the guidance center exchanging messages with Cheyenne. Calote told Cheyenne several times he should get off first, warning and encouraging him to move against the NF. He used coded words and Cheyenne requested that the fellow stand down. Frustrated, Calote walked away from the fence, holding his middle finger in the air pointing backwards. This eyewitness account was shared with me by Sailor Boy, who was still alive in an undisclosed city. He was there. It was Calote, not Joe Morgan, who ordered the NF hits in the guidance center. The Aranda brothers, Ernie and Santos, were stabbed by Sureños led by Joey Ortiz from Lomita Maravilla. The brothers survived and the NF arrived at an obvious decision. Everyone in that unit was aware of what had just taken place with the Aranda brothers. Cheyenne had served more time than any convicted felon in Palm Hall and understood prison dynamics better than anyone. He wasn't some village idiot that just got off the Gilroy garlic pickup truck. On December 17, 1972, an officer asked if he wanted to come out to exercise. Cheyenne had three real options. One, come out and face his adversaries who were biting at the bit to make their move. Two, remain in his cell, be branded a coward, and have his Emma brothers kill him later. Three, remain in his cell and seek protective custody. Cheyenne chose to come out. He was stabbed, beaten, and clubbed by several members of the NF. In the end, it was a Nuestra Familia who succeeded in taking out a Mexican Mafia big fish. To this day, the only Mexican Mafia member killed by a rival prison gang. Rather than give the NF their historical proper credit for a job well done, conspiracy cheerleaders enjoy blaming Joe Morgan, the white establishment, aliens from Mars, or anything in their selection of narratives for Cheyenne's death. The accounts of that day were shared firsthand by participants Gilbert Manita Sandoval from Norwalk, an L.A. gang member who was injured in the attack, and Eddie Crackers Vindiola from Fresno, an NF member 
who participated in this event and later dropped out. Other inmate information was also received corroborating this incident. On Christmas Day, eight days following Cheyenne's Palm Hall murder, MM members killed two NF members at Soledad Central in the final major confrontation between actual members in the last 47 years. The Cheyenne Cadena killing set into motion several scenarios. The biggest historical result was a separation of M.E. and its closest sympathizers who were transferred to Folsom and San Quentin, and the NF was similarly assigned designated prisons DVI and Soledad. When I say no Mexican Mafia members have perished at the hands of a rival prison gang except for Cheyenne Cadena, this is not a statement of glorification about La M. Why would a defector wish to glorify the same group he turned against? Neither do I wish to bolster myself in anyone's eyes, as there is no exultation whatsoever in that life. The facts are the facts, period. The main reason there were no Mexican Mafia members to die at the hands of the NF since the War of 1972 is the very same reason no Nuestra Familia member, except for one in 1977 in Chino, has died at the hands of the M.A. either. They have not been allowed to walk the yards together for 47 years. Instead, Norteños and Sureños have indeed murdered each other without mercy, and only the good Lord can count the bodies with any degree of accuracy. The big homies on both sides view the Norteño and Sureño foot soldiers like pawns, totally expendable for their cause to fight a war by proxy, until they are discarded like dirty rags. The SNY and PC yards are overflowing today with these individuals. History is something no one can spin or rewrite. It simply is what it is, and today's gang experts have the luxury of possessing the massive intelligence that corroborates historical accounts. This intel has been derived from archive reports, debriefs from highly placed OG dropouts, and volumes of gang-related information. For example, the 20-plus correctional officers who covered the 1968 shoe war on September 14th and 15th, not the 16th, who authored the multitude of reports they submitted, would have all had to conspire with the medical authorities who treated the victims to fool everyone for some unknown reason. The 1968 shoe war has already been published on Perplex News for you to check out. I will be submitting a forthcoming episode that will detail the volumes of reports and observations of those days. At that point, you can decide if it's that important what the truth is. Returning to the notion that Joe Morgan had Cheyenne murdered, this suggestion was inferred by the movie American Me and those who drank the Kool-Aid for lack of simply not knowing what was going on, keep forgetting it was a movie of fiction. Don't get fictional characters twisted with the real deal. It's totally untrue. Even Edward James Olmos will tell you that. During the M NF War of 1972, which began in April of 1972 and ended on Christmas Day of the same year, Joe Morgan was on the streets completely out of the loop and oblivious to the conflicts taking place on prison yards. Remember that Joe had just been recruited four years earlier, in 1968, at Folsom Prison. Cheyenne, Acha, Big Mike, Pelon Moreno, Kilroy, and several other big homies had much more influence and power in La M than Joe during this period. So Joe had his own problems on the streets of LA, attempting to launch MS street drug operations with many internal obstacles to contend with. Those obstacles included the September 24, 1972 murder of Alex Taco Aragon at a Montebello, California nightclub called Nutty Nero's. Soon thereafter, he was involved in the murder of a Texas gang member named Jesse Chuy Gonzalez in a Los Angeles residence. The problem with these two homicides is neither had anything to do with Emmett business. Each was the result and consequence of personal conflicts between MA members and two individuals who happened to be connected to gangs. But those are separate stories. In October of 1972, Joe was a suspect in another series of street murders 
and he was working overtime dodging the authorities to even have an inkling of the activities in the prison system. Unless we were talking about a straight up bad apple, a member who needed killing, Mexican Mafia street operators in the 70s had no desire, input, or decision capability in the fates of fellow imprisoned carnales. In the year of 1972, Joe would not even dare suggest that Cheyenne be killed for talking peace with a rival prison gang. Like the vast majority of us, we could disagree with Shai, but just like the fellows overlooked Luis Bala Talamantes participating with BGF rivals in the San Quentin murder of three prison guards and two inmate snitches, Shai's vision of Chicano unification was not taken seriously by any of us. In the end, Shai paid for this with his life. I do remember many of us not really understanding if we were angrier at Cheyenne for not getting off first against his adversaries or at the individuals who murdered him. The murder of Cheyenne Cadena produced long-lasting effects. It led directly to the separation of the NF and M. It also became a polarizing move that allowed inmates from Northern and Southern California to evolve into what we today refer to as Norteños and Sureños. Although I was a major contributor to the polarization of the North versus South in the prison system, I look back today with a heavy heart at the devastation and untold number of senseless deaths that resulted from this dividing of inmates. Like a terminal cancer, it spread throughout California and even infected many other states, the California prison system and the Bureau of Prisons throughout the United States. The collateral damage to innocent families cannot be calculated. Nothing at all to be proud of. In the year of 2020, my vision remains clear. Stay tuned for more and God bless those who pursue good versus evil. May the Lord bless and heal the families of the North and South victims of this senseless conflict, which hopefully will come to an end someday. May God bless Cheyenne Cadena's family, Marika, Lucy, Lupe, and the loved ones he left behind.